Hello, welcome to Quadcast, Quadrant Chambers Weekly Discussion Forum. We are four barristers from London. That is me, Paul Downs, Poonam Wawani, Joe Sullivan and Claudia Wilmot-Smith. And we gather live on YouTube 5pm every week just to talk about some legal stuff, argue about what's right and what's wrong. And we have a, uh, we gather, we invite you to join us for a drink. So I've got a cup of tea. Uh, Some might be drinking something stronger. And we want you to join in. You can send us questions on the YouTube chat function, or you can email us at quadcast at quadrantchambers.com. That's quadcast at quadrantchambers.com. Any questions, comments, do send them through. Um, So firstly, uh, news, what have we all been up to? Uh, Joe, you're, you're in a different location, I think. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm uh, broadcasting from a secret location. Uh, no, it's, it's, been my, um, it's been my daughter's fifth birthday this week. So uh, we, I've had um, a lot of excitement on that front. And it's, been, uh, it's a weird time to have your fifth birthday at the moment, but it's still been fun. Uh, but- have, you reached that, have you reached the stage, Joe, where, you know that stage where the parent and the child overtakes and the parent starts to look to the child for guidance and advice? Is that... Uh, oh, that was a, that was about two years ago, <laughs> and, and, and she's pretty much taller than me now as well. So it's all it's all happening. Um, Definitely stronger. That's that's true, morally and physically. Um, Claudia, how about you? I've been spending a lot of this week overwhelmed by jealousy at the idea of Joe and his birthday pinata for his five year old, which I heard about. <laughs> um, other than that, oh, I listened to a really good talk. Linda Greenhouse gave a talk um, at Middle Temple. She won a Pulitzer Prize for her U.S. Supreme Court reporting. Uh, and yeah, she spoke on the day that Kavan is awful, Wisconsin opinion came out, but luckily before it. Uh, let's move on horribly, actually, from the US Supreme Court at the moment. Uh, Poonam, tell us good things. Well, hang on a minute, Claudia. You haven't told us all your news, have you? Because you've been on your travels. I've, I've, you've been on your travels. Look. <laughs> oh, so where is that? Florida? Honestly, put that up again, Ben, if you oh. can. No. No, he said his most recent comment Look, was that Photographic women... evidence, and you're not socially distanced. I've got a bit of an issue, actually, with this. I don't think the, uh, the sort of the Russian hackers have much to worry about with you, do the poll. <laughs> <laughs> a very convincing picture. Yeah. I'll rescue you, Claudia. So um, I'm excited this week and have good things, because yesterday we had the first ever Quadrant Chambers virtual speed mute uh, and thank you paul um, and producer emily for being two of my many judges but uh, what was really exciting about it is you know with lockdown a lot of mini pupillages have been cancelled a lot of mooting competitions have been cancelled so we decided to do this uh, open out on a first come first serve and uh, 64 mooters uh, plus we had another 50 60 people watching talks by various members of chambers went on for four and a half hours it was a technological wizardry that we were able to do 16 moots at a time in different rooms with different peoples and judges and the standard and quality was excellent so i'm in a i'm a bit exhausted um, but it was a really 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 good evening paul what's your news well it was my birthday on saturday and uh uh, obviously we celebrated uh, had a pool party and now I know what you're thinking was it socially distanced show the picture Ben this is my pool party so there you are <laughs> uh, pool party all Covid secure right okay what are we doing this week we are talking about the FCA test case we're talking about 162 pages of riveting uh, judgment from Lord Justice Flo and Miss Justice Butcher and I've got to uh, explain the basics of this, which is that it's all about business interruption insurance. There are two types of business interruption insurance. You can get the usual type, which is business interruption insurance, which attaches to a damage clause in your policy. So, for example, if your warehouse burns down, the insurer pays for a new warehouse and also pays for your loss of profit. But you can have non-damage Uh, clauses. And this case was about non-damage clauses, i.e. free floating in the ether obligations to indemnify for loss of business caused by COVID directly or indirectly. And uh, Poonam, how how this this test case, how does this all work? I'm a bit suspicious about this. Uh, Right, well, let me tell you how it works. So look, as soon as lockdown happened way back in March, 
there was all this stuff in the news immediately about our policy is going to respond, you know, even these extension clauses that talk about no tribal disease. And it was pretty plain that loads of insurers were going to say, nah, the policies don't respond. So there's a lot of outrage, policyholders worried. So the Financial Conduct Authority, who are the, who's the regulator of insurers, decided to bring a test case on behalf of loads of policyholders, and we'll discuss what that means and whether they were really on behalf of policyholders. Uh, but let's move on from that for the moment, against eight different insurer companies looking at lots of different specimen wordings that prevailed in lots of policies. Um, and the interesting thing is the mechanism by which this was brought. So I don't know whether all of you know about this, but since 2015, there's been something called the financial list within the Queen's Bench Division, uh, which is meant to decide uh, big money claims, raising issues of general financial importance for which English law guidance is needed. And within this list, there's a provision to be able to bring test cases, expedited test cases. And so the FCA and these insurance companies, eight of them, agreed to do this as an expedited test case under the financial list. Uh, and one of the things you can do in, under this scheme is have, as Paul, I think you mentioned, um, almost like a divisional court. There's a first instance judge and a court of appeal judge. So it was Butcher and Flo. And um, it was heard over eight days in July, but it was just legal argument. There was no evidence because it was a test case on points of principle and construction. Um, and the thing that, it, apart from the depressing thing of having to read the 160 page judgment, the most depressing thing was page one, because the whole thing is taken up by the names of all the lawyers involved, which didn't have my name, but I counted in, in irritation, and there were 35 counsel involved in this case, um, and judgment came out in September. Oh, and quick update, very recently, last week or the week before, um, Flo and Butcher gave permission to leapfrog to the Supreme Court. Um, Supreme Court still has to decide whether to agree to have it heard by them as a leapfrog. And if they don't agree, they'll go to the Court of Appeal. But surely, guys, the Supreme Court are going to agree to hear it as a leapfrog. And I assume we'll try and hear it very, very quickly. The platform was issued in, what, May, June? And it might have got through all the way Supreme Court judgment by the end of the year, which is actually pretty amazing. I think this case is... But, is, but has... I'm sorry, I'm sorry to be a party pooper, but has... <laughs> when you court, to be a party pooper? <laughs> ha, I, I don't have any FOMO on this one. Has the court any jurisdiction to engage with these hypothetical um, questions? I mean, the four things about this. Number one, it's not a test case. A test case is where you take one case that's representative of a whole number. Secondly, it raises uh, issues of principle divorce from the fact, so that's hypothetical. Thirdly, it doesn't bind the policyholders, which is fine, I suppose, if the judgments are going against the insurers, but there's no guarantee of that in, in the Supreme Court. And fourthly, the fundamental point is it's not the way the common law operates. Judges don't make these general sort of statutory rulings of principle the whole point of the common law is that you decide it from the ground up you decide it on the basis of of factual dispute and I, i've got i've got i'm sorry i'm sorry but i've got some law on my side because in the uh, first time lord <laughs> you might have support, which is, is actually you, you're going to shout me down they're going to oh, try and put up some defamatory picture just viewers just ignore it um <laughs> Uh, I'm going to press on. House of Lords, House of Lords, House of Lords, Lord Hutton, in the case of uh, the Queen versus the Attorney General ex parte Rishbriga, it's not the function of the courts to decide hypothetical questions. Function of the courts to decide live practical issue uh, questions. No concern with hypothetical premature academic questions. Um, Mrs Justice Cockrell in BMP Paribas and Trattamento, just, this is just this month, delivering judgment um, on what is a hypothetical question, quoting with approval Zamir and Wolf, four factors, no dispute in existence, dispute divorce from the facts, dispute based on hypothetical fact, dispute cease to be a practical significance. Well, I mean, three, maybe four of those satisfied in this case. So there's no, there's no jurisdiction in our courts to decide this sort of uh, thing. Hey, we've all been really quiet while you've, you've had your vet. Where should we start picking them apart? 
Claudia, pick one aspect, pick a part. Then you, Joe. I fundamentally dispute the proposition that this is hypothetical. Hundreds of thousands of policyholders had their claims denied by insurers. The insurers agreed that there were disputes on disputed issues of causation and disputed questions of coverage, and that they could resolve hundreds of thousands of disputes by using specimen policy wording. So these aren't hypothetical divorce from the facts. It's just that a lot of the facts were agreed or could be assumed for the purposes of a case. So rather than having 500,000, maybe a million SMEs clogging up the court system for the next 37 years or however long, the FCA brought a test case that has resolved real disputes. They they estimated that up to 370,000 policyholders might get their claims paid as a result of this judgment. That is not hypothetical, Paul. You see where it goes. What, what the next stage will be, a lot of argument about what this judgment means. And people say, oh, yes, they didn't, they didn't deal with this, they didn't deal with that, and that's going to be a mess. Why is that a reason not, not to do it, though? People would have those arguments in every case. Because if you it's them. not the common law. It's just it's not live. the way we do it. To use, to use Lord Hutton's language that you cited, it's live, yes. It's practical, yes. And just because it doesn't give rise to an issue estoppel doesn't mean that it's not a useful thing to happen. Now, you might say it hasn't been done before, but that isn't on its own a reason not to do it, is it? Well, that's a clue, isn't it? I mean, in, in, in how long have we had the common law in this, this country? I mean, four or five hundred years in its present form. Isn't it, isn't it significant that we've never felt the need to do anything like this before? No, Paul, come on. One of your big things throughout Quadcast has been what's so wonderful about the common law is it can develop and adapt and we can do new CPR procedures. And here we go. <laughs> no, way of it's not the common law, though. OK, all right, let's move on and actually tell people what this case is about that you so disapprove of. Um, jo, what so some facts that were important? I mean, we all know about COVID, but tell us what we need to remember. Yeah, there's just sort of a few key dates. The, the court went through a number of different dates, but the few key dates are 31st of January, the first confirmation of positive tests. Uh, 22nd of February, that's when it was declared to be a notifiable disease. And the 21st of March was when the regulations came in that actually had the effect of closing some businesses down. So I think, although there were a number of other dates, those are really the key ones, it seems to me. Now, Claudia, there were different categories of clause dealt with, weren't there, in the, in the judgment? Yeah, so I think there were 21 specimen policies, which were divided into three broad categories. Disease clauses provide cover for business interruption in consequence of or following from or arising from the occurrence of a notifiable disease, which as Joe just said COVID is, within a specified radius of an insured premises. Then there were prevention of access clauses, which provide cover where there has been a prevention of access to the insured pre premises or a hindrance of access, and that was quite an important distinction as a consequence of government or local authority intervention, actions, restrictions, due to an emergency likely to endanger life. And then the hybrid clauses were a kind of cross between the two. They're about prevention or hindrance of access due to a notifiable disease. Now, in practice, the emergency likely to endanger life requirement in the prevention of access clauses was satisfied by COVID. So the notifiable disease for the hybrid clause was the emergency for the prevention of access clause uh, so in reality, they were pretty similar in this particular case. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're all broadly dealing with this disease. So what do the disease clauses say, Pudan? So yeah, the funny thing, you, you've said the essential bits and I'll come back to that. But what I hadn't realised until I was reading this, and I need to look up the history of these extension clauses, is that this in most of these policies, the clause that dealt with notifiable disease, the other things it dealt with was business interruption due to murder, due to suicide, and due to defective sanitation. And they've got um, these nightmare-inducing names. They're called things like murder, suicide, vermin, pests. Precisely. Like Precisely. I'm not, not quite sure what the linkage is between them all, but um, I'll look up the history one day. So look, as Claudia says, in general terms, you've got to cover the business interruption that's because of, in consequence, arising from, following different words of causation, she says in inverted commas, uh, following an 
incident of notifiable disease within 25 miles of the premises or in the vicinity or whatever. And in most cases, the loss that people were claiming was when they shut down because of the government mandated national lockdown and they had to shut their business. So what the insurer's argument was, and they put it in different ways, they put it as it's not loss that's covered, it's not causation, it's not trend clauses, and we'll be talking about that in more detail. But essentially what they were saying was, fine, you had some COVID in your area, we accept that you did. But that's not the reason for your loss. The reason for your loss is the national lockdown, and that happened nationwide and all over the place. Um, we'll put it another way, your business interruption would have happened regardless of your incidents in your area, it happened because of the lockdown. Uh, their lordships had very little time for this, although they do deal with it again and again and again as they deal with each policy. Uh, but what they basically said was, you've got the trigger. The trigger is you need an incident in the locality. You've got that. That trigger is one of many things that caused the national lockdown, and it's the national lockdown that caused the loss. So you've got the necessary causal connection. Your trigger is the loss because it, it's caused these other effects. And look, leaving all the legal terminology aside, the real thing that drove the court was that this was all covered because of notifiable diseases. And notifiable diseases, by definition, a disease that's so serious, you've got to tell the authorities. And they say, when you have that sort of thing, it's incredibly likely to be expected that there will be wider ramifications it will spread and you will have national measures in response so it's ridiculous to say you've got a notifiable disease cover but that if you have the to be expected national response you don't have cover can i just yeah. ask a, can yeah. i just ask a question and see if everybody agrees i mean as i read this i read it as generally speaking it was favorable to uh policy generally yeah we, we all agree about that Yes, which is why it's such a good test case for them. Which is why, well, well, don't get me started. But that's why the FCA were very keen for this not to be appealed further. They just wanted finality. They thought that they were quit while they were ahead, yeah? I think they've cross-appealed on some points. They certainly asked for permission to appeal on some things. Yeah. Um, but there we are. Um, well, so that's disease clauses. What about... Show prevention of access clauses. Oh no, yes, no, it's you. Me, isn't it? <laughs> I've looked <Sorry>. at that. <laughs> well, uh, it's all as I said. Have I mentioned that I don't think it's a good idea to do these things divorced of the facts? Um, the facts. It's just people know the facts. Paul. Two pretty unsurprising conclusions that I glean from this section of the judgment. Number one is that prevention means prevention. So if you've got partial use of the premises, you've not been prevented from using them. Um, and I think we're going to mention, or if we're, we're not, that the whole distinction between prevention is something stronger than hindrance. But it also again, includes legal prevention, right? So it's not just I can't get in because there's like a snowdrift in front of my front door. Yeah, there's a measure of impossibility with, with regard to you getting into the premises caused, obviously, by well, the well, in short event. But does this but, raise, I mean, I'm sorry to give, I'm actually supporting you on this. Does this give, give rise to sort of arguments about if you're a restaurant, you were prevented from having people eat there, but you wouldn't have been prevented from doing your takeaway? if you did take away. So I think there was a question about whose access was prevented as well, right? Is it enough that I can't get in as the business holder? Or what about if I can get in and operate my takeaway business, but customers can't come? So their access is prevented. Is that enough? But yeah, I mean... The, the, they went a different route and they said the takeaway business is a different business. You see, this is the point. Every time you get to anything interesting about, for example, the online, the retailer who switches to online, um, any time you get to anything interesting... It all, they always say, oh, well, that's all facts specific. So yeah, apart from the pretty obvious answer. No, they, so, so if you switch to online retailing, then you've opened a different kind of business. So you're, the business that you have, which is operating out of a physical premises, has been interrupted. You can but it's not absolute because you could have a situation where 
the retailer has some online business, but it's not a major thing. And then they major on it afterwards. It's not like a binary thing. You can, you can have no, it. I see that. But the reason why they were refusing hundreds of thousands of claims weren't because of these specific factual issues. That they, they were these points of principle that have now been resolved to the benefit of, on current estimates, 390,000. Right. Okay. Oh. Jeff, tell us about the other type of clauses. Well, hang on a minute. There's a second thing on the, the prevention, oh, sorry, Paul, which sorry. is that. The difference between government advice and government action that causes the interruption. So, if so, for example, there was a lot of problems from just simply guidelines, uh, things like social distancing, things like that, that weren't actually law. And then you've got these other cases where whole business had to shut because they it was illegal for them to operate as a business, and that some wording would apply to both, and some wording would only apply where the government action forced the business. Uh, to close down. Um, but yes, yeah, so uh, Claudia, uh, no, Joe, hybrid clauses. Hybrid clauses, there's very little of general principle to learn. They, they made findings on specific points. I mean, it, the findings followed findings on the disease clause, so the 25 mile point. They followed findings on prevention clauses about whether restrictions have to be mandatory. They do in order to be a restriction. Um, and the Prevention of access is obviously a, a stricter requirement than hindrance of, of access and, and, and words like that. But it's not, it's not really possible to discern much more of general application than the points already made in connection with the other two categories of clause. I mean, what, one thing I picked up a lot when I was reading through the judgment is this idea of, of causation and, and in particular proximate cause. What, what's that all about, Claudia? So, well, the fundamental principle of insurance law is you tend to recover for losses proximately caused by the insured peril. And that's not the first or the last cause. It's not a temporal requirement. It has to be the dominant or the efficient cause of the loss. And insurer's big argument in this was that these are all about something within a specific radius of the policy, um, of the, sorry, the premises insured by the policy. And so you cannot say that a loss to my premises has been proximately caused by something within that radius when it would have had the same effect because of the national lockdown. Um, and they put in an 83 page skeleton argument on causation. And I read it and I have got so much to say about it. Oh, sorry, you read it? The whole 83 page skeleton on one point? Just for yeah, causation is so interesting. It's really good. And I could talk about it literally for like forever, but you all breathe a massive sigh of relief when I say they just they resolved it really as a causation issue. And Poonam basically just took the wind out of my sails because, as, as she says, they, they describe it's a question of construction. They say, look at the policy. What are they intending? What is covered by this? So the proximate causation point was really resolved by the construction question. The hurdle they had to arguably overcome was this Orient Express case, which deals with them. Um, Katrina hitting Louisiana, destroyed a hotel, but also destroyed the whole of New Orleans, right? And um, Mr. Justice Hamlin said in that case that if the damages to the property and the damage to the town, both of which would have interrupted the business, whether the other one was there or not, then the hotel couldn't recover. And I think Paul's going to tell us about that because Hamblin might be in the Supreme Court. Is he going to listen to this case? Well, that's the, inter that's the sort of personal interest of story, isn't it? That we've got here them being reasonably um, unkind to uh, Mr Justice Hamblin as he was. Um, paragraph 523, what we that's see fine. is the fallacy in the judge's reasoning can be found in the last sentence of paragraph 52. However, the relevant insured peril is the damage, not the cause of the damage. Same fallacy appears in 46, 47 and 57, which we've quoted. The hurricanes as the cause of the damage were an integral part of the insured peril, not separate from it. So in other words, if you treat the insured peril as simply as the damage to the hotel, then you can argue, well, even if that hadn't occurred, you'd still be in the same position you are because the whole area was wiped out. But once you understand that the insured peril includes the hurricane itself, if you strip that out of the equation, then no damage is done anywhere. And so therefore your hotel would be uh, profitable. And this, this sort of theme, the but for causation issue, runs <coughs> through the, the whole judgment um, in these trends clauses, because uh, the trends clauses 
um, make specific provision for this and say that the insured can't be in a better position than they would have been had no insured peril occurred. So what all these insurers were saying, well, if no insured peril had occurred, i.e. no notifiable disease within that 25 miles, doesn't matter because your business would still have been shut down because there was loads of it elsewhere and the they government would have still locked down. Yeah. But they, they didn't and, like that. But and we'll see the, where they talk about counterfactuals, isn't it? Yeah. And, and what you put in and what you don't. So they say you take away the hurricane, but you also take away the national response because it's all... Yeah. So right. in this 83 page skeleton, the insurer has said, well, there's no requirement for the counterfactual to have any degree of reality. It doesn't have to be a real ca counterfactual. So they said it's just no COVID in this area. Then what would But, the, but, but the fallacy they point out, if unless um, Lord Hamlin is in now, is, uh, has a sort of fight back on this. But even if that's right, that wouldn't actually apply, would it, on a lot of these wordings? Because it is fair to say that the insured peril is, for example, a notifiable disease within the 25 miles. So you can't say the insured peril is all of COVID everywhere, can you? But they do say that. They say the notifiable disease of which each local occurrence is an individual visible part. Or, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think they... Ways, they say that, but then they also say each local one is in itself sufficient. That's for the first part of the argument, but I don't think they repeat that analysis in the in the trends clause, do they? Oh, no, they do, because they rely on the fact, they absolutely do, they rely on the fact of this indivisible part, each little COVID is part and parcel of the big thing, to then say for the counterfactuals, you therefore take away the big thing that's being caused yeah. by the little thing. All of the, all of the COVID. Exactly. Yeah. Bodies yeah. piling up in the streets or whatever. They would that's because they first discuss it in the hundreds and then they go back to it in the 500s when they're doing um, trend clauses. It's just oh, very paragraph numbers, which is just such a long judgment. But, um, but what, so what does this mean? Do we have any examples? Like that we We're going to do some facts now, are we? Yeah, we've got a, a couple of case studies that we've, we've managed to come up with that hopefully will illustrate. And, and if anybody can give me the precise paragraph references that answer these case studies in the judgment, I'll be very impressed. <laughs> Uh, yeah. By the way, um, we should say if any of our viewers want to give answers on the chat, Emily can tell us. As, as Joe is troubling us with these thorny <laughs> issues, any <laughs> the audience gratefully received. Yeah. So case study number one, we've got um, the cover clause there, uh, cover for BI, which results from the occurrence of a notifiable disease which affects more than 5% of the individuals resident within a 25-mile radius of the premises. And the question is, would there be cover if fewer than 5% of the individuals resident within that radius were diagnosed with COVID-19? So, um, Poonam, what's the answer to that? Um, just to break it down a bit more, the clause in the policy talked about a notifiable disease which affects more than 5%. Yeah. Can, we have, can we have the clause, clause yeah. up again just to look it at it? It says which mm. affects more than 5%. Um, so my first issue is what does affect mean? Um, does that mean you have to have COVID? Does it mean you have to live with someone who's got COVID? Or were we all not affected by COVID because the thing put us into lockdown? I don't think it can possibly mean the last. I don't think we could all say we've been affected. It plainly means if you actually had it, does it mean if you're a caregiver for someone who's got it? I still don't think it does. That would be my first question. But then the other issue comes up about the way you've questioned, raised the question, but I'll let someone answer that. Um, that's my first thought on it. Anybody else have some thoughts? So paragraph 93 of the judgment, Paul, is your reference. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting my notes out. <laughs> is that a reference to diagnosis, Claudia? Yes, exactly. Uh, so an occurrence doesn't require diagnosis. Well, hang um, on a minute. That was a different wording, though. That was a different wording. That was that was about the notified diagnosis. Then being affected can't require diagnosis. No, and that was sustained. I've, I've picked up paragraph one to three. That was sustained, wasn't it? Occurs yeah. when it's sustained by the. But so Poonam reckons that you're wait. That was what? That so was sustained. Paragraph ninety three says, um, "Such a disease thus occurs in inverted commas." when the illness is sustained, which we consider means in simple terms, suffering, not diagnosed. So that's right, a different exactly. context. There's no diagnosis requirement. 
And well, I that's think that, for occurs, not for effects. It, that's true. But the no material distinction. There's, there's not going to be a material distinction. I mean, if you're going to try and argue that, then you'll. Some of these hypotheticals. Um, it's not a. This is a real policy one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also, so Poonam's point is, I think, quite. What about if you're a caregiver? If I haven't been diagnosed, or and I don't have it, I'm I'm not ill, but somebody in my household has been diagnosed with COVID, as a result of which. I am lawfully precluded from leaving my house. I would say that I, there's a good argument to say that I've been affected by um, that notifiable disease. So I think it could be broader than Poonam suggests. Okay, who agrees with Claudia? I think affected means you have to have it. Forget about whether you need to be diagnosed or whatever. I think affected means you have to have it. I'm with you, Poonam, I think. Although I, I, I think it's a difficult one. I think a lawful restriction imposed might be enough. I, Jen, I, think, you, I think Claudia's right because I think affected has to mean something different from the language used in the clauses that the the court looked at and otherwise it's it's not being given any different meaning and it seems to me that it has to mean something more i i i agree you have you would have to place some sort of a limit on it and but i just your first your first reaction when you read that you think affects means that they've got the, got covid doesn't it I think if I think if I'm subject to different legal restrictions as a result of COVID, then that's enough. I think this guidance slash legislation distinction might be relevant here, actually. Paul, I couldn't agree with you more. You, you said affected means got COVID. Agreed. You've got COVID. You don't have to be diagnosed with it. You just no, well, I, I, I agree with that. I, I think that's probably right. Um, how on All earth do right. you go anyway. about <laughs> Case study two, people, if we could get the slide up. It's quite wordy, so let's try and take it in. So imagine that the policy says, we will provide cover from BI following the occurrence of a notifiable disease within a 25-mile radius. So we've looked at this, we've discussed this wording. But here we've got an exception clause, imagine, that says we will not provide cover for business interruption caused by your inability to use the premises which results from public authority restrictions. So we can take the slide down. I'm just going to ask the first question. Would there be cover for business interruption caused by the national lockdown? Views. Who wants to go? Joe. Um, I think there probably wouldn't be cover because it's, I mean, it's probable that the, the national lockdown I mean, it would slightly depend on the circumstances, but probable that that would, would cause an inability to use the premises. And so I think it would fall within the, within the exception here. Uh, and, um, yeah, so that, that's my view. It might right. depend on the business, mightn't it? It might, the, yeah. But yeah, I mean, but the, the point Joe makes, right, if, if there are two causes of my business interruption, so one is the fact that no one wants to go to the pub, and another is the fact that I'm not allowed to open the pub, uh, the second is I would have suffered the same result as I. But the second is excluded and the first isn't. Then I cannot claim because the exclusion clause applies. Whereas if I'm not covered for that, it's not excluded. Then I may still be able to recover. Um, and that's this Orient Express slash Miss JJ. Um, yeah, so two causes, one's covered, one's excluded, you can't claim. Two causes, one's covered and one's not covered, but it's not specifically excluded, you can claim. That was the easy one, people, and we managed doesn't, to talk about Doesn't that. proximate cause, though, come in there? Oh, yes. You are assuming that these are two independent causes of... of depending on each I mean, other. If you could show, for example, that the... One. If you could show, for example, that the principal reason your pub wasn't operating was because of the not nothing to do with the lockdown but that was just sort of like a minor complication i mean di maybe different facts but yeah so there's an unresolved right, question what i was just saying um applies as the law way or two causes are interdependent yeah if two causes are independent um insurers were arguing that the same principles apply and the court said they didn't have to yeah. decide but that's a thorny one. Right, we need the slide up for this longer second question. So um, my second question, and I'm warning you, Joe, I'm going to you first again because okay. like you are the answer. Um, would there be cover for business interruption caused by a lockdown 
but where the lockdown doesn't apply to where the policyholder's premises is, but it applies to the area where its suppliers live. And so the effect of the lockdown over there in County B is that the supplies can't come to County A where the business is. Joe, what's your answer to that? I'm going to say yes. I think I think there is cover. I think you've got cover probably because the causation requirement of the cover clause is met following probably. And I don't think the exception would apply because that reason for business interruption doesn't really arise from an inability to use the premises. It's it's a different reason. It's about supply. So I'm going to say yes, cover. Okay, I understand because you're saying the exclusion is limited to use where you can't use your premises and the suppliers aren't, so the exclusion doesn't buy. Yeah, yeah exactly. You say that it's covered under the main provision. Claudia, do you agree with that, honey? No, no. But so th- this is actually think actually quite an interesting example. So you said the business interruption is caused by a local lockdown that isn't in this twenty-five mile radius. So. I agree with you that it's not excluded, but prima facie, it's not even covered, right? But if this local lockdown, which is in Manchester and I'm in London today, um, is the result of COVID in Manchester and I am in London and obviously there has been an occurrence of a notifiable disease within 25 miles of my premises, if that's all part of one indivisible cause that's caused the lockdown in Manchester, but that hasn't stopped me from using my premises. Does that mean I'm covered? Maybe. I think the local lockdown, the way the local lockdowns have now worked since um, this test case was divided, uh, divided, decided, has maybe given rise to quite interesting questions about the consequences of this idea that it's one indivisible cause. Because that means something local to me has caused a lockdown, like the tier four restrictions they're talking about in Scotland, for example. Unless you could show maybe that someone someone got coronavirus in London and then went on a jolly up to Manchester and infected everyone. <laughs> why, isn't the, why isn't the answer... It was a road garden super spreader event. Then yeah. I think- <laughs> why isn't the answer that stage one is the, the first part satisfied? Well, provided you've got a fairly loose con- uh, connection between the notifiable disease in the 25 mile radius and the business interruption, you're okay. So you're off the ground there. And then the exception doesn't apply because I can't see any way in which supplier difficulties would result in an inability to use the premises. Might might be a problem, but it's not going to make you unable to use the premises. No, 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 we agree with that. We think Joe's right on that, but, but focus on this. You, you just said the following is, is satisfied the cover. I mean, the whole reasoning, as, as Claudia was saying, of this to court was, right, you've got your occurrence near your premises, and then because the national lockdown was a response, this, this, this to everything, your one occurrence here caused the national lockdown. Where we're now operating as we are now with different na- lockdowns in different counties, how do you say that an incident here in London was the trigger for the lo- different lockdown, tier three or whatever it is, in Manchester. Because baked into this question is the premise that the cause of my interruption is the restriction on my supplier. <coughs> Not that well, has, are you saying there's been no notifiable disease within a 25-mile radius? No, 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 there has, there, there been. has been, but it hasn't caused any local restrictions. My pub can open. Everybody is welcome. There is no rule of six. People can super spread at will. But I don't yeah. have to serve them because my Manchester supplier is locked down because of COVID, which is also in London. It's just London has different regulations. That's where yeah, I see the I see the point. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I see the point. And it doesn't really address this, does it? Because it's decided before the local lockdown. So nobody really argued this point. No, exactly. exactly. Oh, and it's an interesting one, right? It's, it, this set of lockdowns is going to raise questions that have not been decided by this test case. Yeah, well, what did I tell you? I warned you. I don't think means the test case wasn't worth having because they're, but yeah, it does. Right. Are we talking about something that makes you happy next week, Paul, since you didn't like me? Next week, we're on that. contractual estoppel, aren't we? We thought. Oh, I'm not contractual estoppel. We thought First Tower trustees had killed this heresy. I mean, don't get me started on contractual estoppel. Um, 
we thought it had rightly. We thought that Leggett had killed it, and 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 no, uh, was it Lewis? Lewison had killed it. Sorry, in First Tower Trustees. But now we have a judgment saying that was all obiter, and it's all back uh, back in place. So we're going to be looking at that next uh, week. Um, just before I uh, wind up and say thank you to uh, people for helping. Um, can I encourage you, if you like these broadcasts, please like us on YouTube. All you have to do is move your mouse over the like and give us the thumbs up. That really helps the algorithms and uh, gets more views on YouTube. And the second thing is, please subscribe. If you're not subscribing already, subscribe to the Quadrant YouTube channel. Even if you hate quadcast on that we're putting out. So there's shipping specials, there's five minute briefings. Yeah, I was on the last one. It's really good. If you hate quadcast, watch the shipping special later. Watch Poonam. Give her some views on her shipping special. But, but subscribe because you're going to get notified of all those videos and all those broadcasts out. So like and subscribe. Questions for next week, if you email them to us at quadcast at quadrantchambers.com. That just leaves it for me to say thank you to the podcast team thank you to our long-suffering producer emily salderson and to fisheye productions ben jacobs for doing the live streaming thank you very much see you next week